very good evening to all our viewers. Thank you for joining us today on the agenda. My name is Toivo Njebela, your host. Tonight on the show, we are joined by Desiree Obal. She is uh, the presidential advisor on youth and enterprise development, as well as uh, Dimbulukeni Naoyoma, who is uh, a social justice activist. They are here to talk about uh, youth-related matters, especially unemployment, and, and of course, the subject of uh, youth development itself. Uh, Desiree, thank you for making time. Thank you. Thank you, Toivo, for having me. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, thank you for making time, young man. Uh, welcome back to the platform. No, thank you very much, Tayo, to you for having me. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. I'll start with you. Uh, you are fresh from uh, jail <laughs> <laughs> because you actually went uh, toy toying on the streets on the 21st of March uh, to, among others, essentially to demand jobs. What was the context of your marching on that day? I think we on the onset, let's set the record straight. Uh, there's a misconception. There was no protest that took place. Yeah. Um, we simply gathered to inform these colleagues that we would not be able to protest because the court has upheld the decision of the Inspector General, of which we want to challenge again because he said he didn't have enough manpower, um, and of which we saw the deployment of the police of around 34 cars and the main power that was on site, which mm -hmm. could have assisted and aided these young people to have this protest. Yeah. But uh, it emanated from the events of the 10th of March, where people, where young people gathered um, to seek employment at their walk in, some new fashion, you know, young people are innovative, some sort of new fashioned way of doing interviews. They say it's a walk in interview, and we saw that stampede the temperature, which then consciously alerted us as activists and say, but when last day we have a concrete discussion around the high unemployment rate and youth unemployment in particular, mm -hmm. and what other policies are we able to engage and bring forth to government to have a conversation around this issue around um, youth unemployment and what is it that we can do. But particularly looking at the Ministry of Labor and Employment Creation, mm -hmm. uh, of which there hasn't been any substantial policies uh, that are targeted intervention to Keep the 1.2 million unemployment, unemployed people that we have in our country, over 200,000 graduates that are merely every day uh, that are flushed out on the street. Uh, there are now graduations happening. Families are excited that at least somebody has completed four years of study, but they would be more depressed to see this person for the next five years sitting at home. So we wanted to highlight and bring forth this national crisis for us to engage and debate on it at all fronts. It's not necessarily just about jobs, but it is about how do we create a platform for that young person with an idea to have that idea assessed, to implement that idea and create employment for others. Yeah. Days when you, you, you must have obviously uh, seen what happened on, on the day uh, you advised the president on youth related matters. What was your impression of what was happening on the streets on that day and what kind of message did you relate to the president on the day? Toivo, as a government, we are a listening government. We were not caught by surprise by the events of uh, 21 March. We were notified of the intent of the young people to gather and to mobilize peacefully on the streets of Windhoek. And the young people were advised to follow the due process in mm -hmm. terms of seeking the relevant authorities from the institutions, the law enforcement agencies, in order for law enforcement to render the necessary support and protections yep. to persons and to private property, whoever wanted to participate. However, 21 March is also a day that is sacrosanct in our country's history. Mm. 21 March is the day that we commemorate solemnly the price of freedom, the hard-earned freedoms that we won, and it is a day where the president was leading the nation in this commemoration in a different region in the northern part of the country. So following the, the preceding events uh, leading up to, to the National Day, what I can say to the young people is that we were in consultation providing guidance as office bearers on what would be an acceptable approach mm -hmm. um, in order for them to conduct themselves on the day. 
We did not want to see that day descend into chaos. We did not want to see disruptions and the distractions from the real reason we were celebrating 21 March. Mm -hmm. We certainly did not want to see newspaper headlines um, of uh, clashes mm -hmm. between young people and the law enforcement agencies because this is not an issue of um, young people clashing against their government. This is a matter that concerns all of us where the government is as acutely aware and as equally concerned and preoccupied with providing the leadership solutions to get, at, mm -hmm. to get us out of this situation. So I really believe that it w was avoidable um, 21 March. It is not that government was not willing to provide a platform to engage, yeah. um, to hear, or even to receive the petition. Mm. Why did you choose uh, 21 March of all days? Well, you see, there is, uh, of course, 33 years of flag independence uh, where we celebrate fundamental human rights, uh, which protest is enshrined in that Bill of Rights. Um, and of course, everybody uh, for years has chosen to celebrate it differently. If you don't get to Independence Stadium or wherever the independence is being celebrated, uh, we choose to celebrate it by other side the bus. But we assessed the day and we said, look, there are people who are employed and they are concerned about this thing called black tax. Uh, and this is the only platform that they could get to join and show sympathy with the unemployed. So the day was merely um, a day to say, look, we are celebrating independence. And for 33 years, we've listened to messages from heads of states, some inspirational, some none. And we are now simply saying, look, on this date, 33 years later, we have this level of unemployment in the country. What are we going to do about it? The first day preceding to that following day, the president had a state of the nation address, and we listened attentively. And in addressing the unemployment, he says we are opening up the security cluster. But you would understand that we are having young people who are perceived or who have an interest in entrepreneurship. We didn't hear that sound message that is going to inspire young people. As we speak today, Toivo, Nampawa has tenders that are being offered. One of the things that we must congratulate them on is to say now they don't have, they don't want one company running more than one tender at the same time. Now, this is where the problem is. The requirements that are set in there does not allow for a young Namibian to participate in this economic vehicle. We looked at the tender board, for example, and we look at that act that guides the tender board. It is not uh, <laughs> associating with these young people. So what we wanted to do is that on that particular sacred day where their blood waters our freedom and how can we enjoy this freedom and peace that everybody speaks highly of you know when somebody says let's guard peace i'm saying let's guard peace because i sleep peacefully i'm guarded i have access to everything that i want mm -hmm. but somebody who lives in informal settlements does do they really honestly have the peace that we are talking about do they really enjoy the fruits of independence yeah. that we are seemingly supposed to, to have and enjoy. So when we listen to these freedom fighters who were in the bush yeah. and they sing and they say, once we liberate our, so our land, we are going to enjoy the fruits of our country. It's peace and stability for everybody. Today we have the struggle kids who are camping there by Ndilimani. The same government who is here because of their fathers who did not make it. I mean, when you look at 1988, 1989, the, the, the Scandinavian countries gave the Swapo uh, party scholarships to aid children whose parents have died in the liberation struggle. Those that have died in Kasinga. To say that because these kids may not get anywhere else any assistance, because they are returning back and they may not find their families there. Yeah. Let us take them in, give them education, and ensure that when the country is liberated, they can be contributors to the growth of our country. What happened? The ones that are close to power and what we call political elites are the ones that benefited. And that is why we have majority of those kids that are still there. So what we, are, what we wanted to elevate is this national crisis that we have and say, maybe it is another time or a platform where we must engage. In parliament, they've passed a motion on uh, youth unemployment. President says he's 
contemplating whether to call a national uh, um, state of emergency on the unemployment crisis. Yeah. At the same time, he says, look, we must be careful because these issues can be funded uh, to cause terrorism and instability in our country. We've seen what happened in Ukraine. Yeah. No Namibian wants to say that we can't have access to hospitals anymore. It's difficult for us to access the banks. All we are seemingly was trying to say is, let us elevate where that motion is. And you. say, that motion is now in parliament, is now being discussed, but here are the faces on that motion that we need to engage on. I hear you. Do, do you want to respond to him on, on anything specific that he said? I think it's important. Dimbulukwini has made an expression of the frustration and the crescendo that is there. And there's absolutely no contradiction. Picking up on the narrative of freedom fight, this is the second phase of the struggle. Mm -hmm. And I think in the words of the late Andimba Toivo, Toivo, may he rest in peace, he said that the second phase would be even harder than the first phase because it is individualistic. Prosperity tends to be. We have come a long way and I want us to backtrack to how we came to the situation that is not only peculiar to Namibia. I must always cast the contrast that unemployment levels, particularly youth unemployment, yeah. are a phenomenon not only in the sub-Saharan African region but continentally and globally. And that is because there are some mega trends that are driving these forces. Mm -hmm. We didn't just wake up in the belly of the beast and in crisis. Um, it, I think it has been by structural design over the 33 years because even at the best of times, the Namibian economy is not a mass employment creating economy mm. in terms of job generation. And that is because of the primary sectors that drive our economic growth. They are highly mechanized and they are resource based. Mm. But there have also been some trends before 2020 COVID-19 hit yeah. that were already indicative that the progression is negative. The time that His Excellency the President came into government and took the seat of the presidency, there was the global slowdown. Yeah. That had an impact on commodity prices. We are a country that is trading on commodities. Uh, diamond prices were depressed, uranium was depressed, um, oil was depressed, Angola, South Africa, their remittances to us had significantly reduced yeah. in terms of revenue flows. We were already in a situation where we didn't, we had falling levels of employment because of some trends. Namibia was in a state of deindustrialization in terms of manufacturing by 2018. We had a protracted drought from 2016. And if you study agriculture, agriculture is the sector that creates the most jobs for unskilled young people. Yeah. In between 2016 and 2018, the agricultural sector had shared jobs significantly because of the drought and then the, the cycle of flooding that had, that had ensued. Yeah. Uh, when we came into, into office, through the Minister of Finance, Honorable Kalesh Letvan at the time, to contain government expenditure, we had to ensue the policy of fiscal consolidation to rein in public expenditure. That had an impact. Government is 65% of this economy. So in terms of procurement, capital projects, it, it slowed down significantly the capital projects and, and the contracts. Mm. That had a contribution to the jobs in construction, the jobs on roads works, which are youth jobs, and not to mention COVID-19, which mm. we cannot ignore because tourism, services, hospitality, they directly support 150,000 Namibian jobs. We saw our brothers and sisters being retrenched um, because of the reduction in global tourism traffic yeah. to Namibia. And tourism is one of the sectors that really drive um, revenue flows into our economy. So it is fair to raise the crescendo and to say that something must be done. Mm. But it would be extremely naive, if not ignorant, to contextualize the trajectory that has gotten us to where we are. And what we must do as we provide leadership and governance to navigate out of yet another crisis. President has been navigating crises upon crises. And I should put it to you that he is the one president who has not been shy to broker these difficult conversations, including the very one that we're having. Mm -hmm. what, it, what, it, what the government is doing is addressing the fundamentals in order to engender more inclusive and more shared growth. 
I can highlight to you, Toivo and Dibolukweni, that even when we had the least between 2015, when our GDP growth started to go into negative growth, we started to see contractions on GDP. Yeah. That is the time that government took a decisive policy to strengthen social support. That is the time that we shared more. When mm -hmm. we had less, we shared more. We intensified spending into TVET. We strengthened uh, social safety nets. And I understand the distinction between poverty alleviation and wealth creation. Mm -hmm. But it is important to keep citizens above water. And we cannot deny that that intervention from a fiscal strategy point of view mm -hmm. has alleviated the problem. Now, when it comes to economic growth, there are those sectors that have contracted. Construction is subdued. Mining was subdued. Yeah. Tourism is on the rebound, um, among others. We have to find new frontiers for growth. We can thank God that we have now made the oil discoveries. Um, we, government is providing not only continental but global leadership to lead the green transition. We've created a new synthetic fuels industry, which I am co-chairing the socioeconomic development work stream that is looking at jobs, employment, procurement, skills training, mm. housing. And that project alone is earmarked to be one of the biggest FDI investments in our country's history. Mm. And it has the potential to create a lot of new opportunities for young Namibians. Um, overall, in the President's Harambe Prosperity Plan, which is our four-year plan to deliver more inclusive growth and more shared prosperity, we have 193 projects in the HPP2. Mm -hmm. If the HPP2 is executed to precision, it has the potential through those projects to unlock 27 billion Namibian dollars. If executed to precision, it has the potential, and I keep it at potential because implementation and execution is another discussion, mm -hmm. to generate 42,000 new jobs in this economy. And I should highlight that that excludes the hyphen green hydrogen project, which is an outlier because of the scale and the magnitude of that project. So I think we will do ourselves a greater service not to only focus on the problem of unemployment, but to rather become more focused mm. on what it will take for us to create and to sustain businesses, enterprises that can engender those opportunities, those new jobs. Yeah, I hear you. I don't know whether to ask you because there's also a break coming up because I know this man will not uh, <laughs> will not stop now. But if you if you can in two minutes before you're going to break, Dimbulukeni, uh, if you engage with a lot of unemployed young people um, on the streets in the hood, if I can call it that way, Kadutura, and elsewhere of course in the country, if you were to go to them with what uh, Desiree just said, uh, giving them this particular answer, what, what would be their, uh, their reaction? Look, it's, it's a, I think the, the one of the fundamental problems is that we are, we are trying to look at uh, this youth unemployment from, from a perspective of job creation, but not creating opportunities. Now, I want to give you two examples, Toivo. We've read what the Bank of Namibia has released in its financial status. Now, where is the vested interest of Bank of Namibia, Namibia's central bank? It's in South Africa. What does that mean? It's creating jobs in South Africa. But if we had a drought period, if we are having um, economic downturns in particular industries, what limits the Bank of Namibia to take out five, just five billion of what it has invested in South Africa, bring it into Namibia and says, look, we are opening up a scope. Arambe one spoke about 121 com um, enterprises. In, in each constituency, there's supposed to be a youth enterprise that is supposed to deal with these matters. We, we welcomed that because, you see, each constituency has its own needs uh, basis and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So at that level, if we can have five billion back into our economy where young people can start trading amongst themselves or bring about whatever ideas that they have so that they can generate and create employment and so that we are also fueling that entrepreneurship skills that we want to put in. The Minister of Higher Education, for example, came when she came in and she says, no, 
each uh, vocational training, a government funded must have a uniqueness in all spectrum where they are operating from. Mm. That it's just what we've had. In reality, what is it that we are doing about it? There's a Tibet levy, but we could utilize some of that money and say, you that is operating in Kavango, instead of us taking our trees to China and selling our timber, we want you to now start fabricating or manufacturing chairs, tables, and whatever that we want to use. Mm. It's a practical step that we can do to, towards addressing that. Let's get to GIPF. Where has it invested its money? Over 60% of GIPF money is invested where? Across the globe, not in Namibia. Mm. Even the money that is kept here for a property developer to access that money from, uh, uh, what are they called? These guys who keep the money for GIPF. Yeah, the, um, the, investment the asset managers. Asset managers so yes. for you to get money from an asset manager, it's an uphill stream for a young person. So you, you look at what is our vested interest. Yes, we hear what the policies are supposed to address. But what is the practical reality that is on the, on the ground? Because this is what you meet a young person saying, look, we have read what DBN is supposed to do and aid young people through these youth loan schemes that they have. But the implementation, like she's saying, is another thing. So there isn't, we have a complete mismatch between a policymaker and implementer. Because the policymaker simply just wants to score political points and says, look, this is the policy that I've, that I've done. But unfortunately, we don't go back to the ground and say, okay, Dimbolo Kenny, when we agreed in 2020 that DBN has allocated 2.2 billion for SMEs, how many S in the SME have benefited? What are the criteria that we've put down? Bank of Namibia releases uh, a COVID-19 loan recovery scheme of up to 500, uh, 500 million or so. Yes, but here is the crisis. Look at the criteria that are there. Who qualifies on this loan recovery? There isn't anything that speaks about expansion. There's nothing that, it's, it's, it's consumption that we are focused on. So yes, uh, we understand the, so the safety nets uh, social protection nets that government has invested in. But if we were to take a decision and say, when we increased the pension fund of old people from 600 to 1.2, where did we get that money from? Where did we get that extra 600 from? Because it's a government burden and we are not, we, it's a consumption. Yes, we understand that old people were suffering in the villages and they needed to, to do that. But we must ask ourselves, now we are told that the disabled people and the children are now going to get the same 1.2 from 250. All those uh, investments that government is making, we don't see the same energy that says, we are creating this 5 billion mm. from the investments of Bank of Namibia or from the pension uh, fund, which is GIPF, not directly from Treasury. This is money that they are already playing with within the market and saying we just want to expatriate it and bring it back in the economy so that we can see the spaces where we can invest in startups so that they are able to scale up. So the conversation that the young people would have is to say, look, we've listened to that talk before, but we, unfortunately when we come and see what is happening on the ground, it's a different story. So it, it doesn't become inspirational for the next young person to have that conversation. But of course, it's not that we are saying that we don't see the efforts that government has put in. That is why we said we appreciated this 121 youth enterprises, but we want to see what is it that they've been up to um, six, seven years later after their implementation. Yes. We go for a quick breather and come back. Hmm. E-Ticket, your online ticket solution for events and event marketing, bringing you ease of mind and making sure that your event gets out there.
Please, put on your safety belt, sir. It's very important for your life. Uh, the seatbelt doesn't make me drive comfortably. Yes, that's better. Please wear your seatbelt. I did not. The show continues. Um, Day three, if you can just, um, there's something that he mentioned before we went on a break, which I, I, I've been subjecting to a lot of analysts and, and, and people in positions like yourself. And that is what I perceive as a very heavy emphasis on certain groups like old people that somehow we always find a way to take care of them. Of course, I understand they are venerable people. They cannot do much on their own. But that has seemingly taken a lot away from other equally needy groups like the unemployed youth that somehow we, I mean, even in now in the, in the budget of the finance minister, there's been a, a small provision of, I think, an extra hundred dollars for my grandmother, for my mother, rather. <laughs> but my, my young cousin is unemployed. Where in, in this sketch uh, can we locate uh, young people? It's a very responsible statement, Toivo, because it, you are looking at it to say exclusively the old age pension uh, in lieu of the rest of the government investment on young people. I think when you are presiding over a nation as young as Namibia, where 71.6% of our population is under the age of 35, yeah. I put it to you that every minister especially the economic ministers, are youth ministers. The Minister of Education, the Minister of Agriculture, the Minister of Fisheries, the Minister of Health, they're presiding over a young populace. Secondly, the investment into the public good of government, if you had to look at it in terms of demographic outlay, this government is resourcing young people highly across lower primary, higher education institutions in terms of sectors of growth and public enterprises that are generating jobs that directly and indirectly benefit young people. Yeah. What I'm trying to communicate is that it is difficult for you to contrast and say that a comprehensive social safety net is at the expense of an allocation in favor of young people. Because within our social safety nets, I can with authority share with you that there are 350,000 orphans and vulnerable children mm. who are supported by the government. There are 330,000 school-going Namibian children who are receiving a daily meal through the government school feeding program. And 50% unemployed youth. Even the 50% now, I think we, it's important that we speak with the authority of, of data. And I acknowledge that the nearest data point is 2018 with the Labor Force Survey of the Namibia Statistics Agency. We are hopeful that our country will be able to deliver th the next census mm. um, be in the final quarter of this year. But even those figures we need to interrogate because we speak of youth unemployment as 43% of the broad. That means of the 38%, 43% mm. are young people. When we look at who that 43% is, quantifiably, it's 246,000 young Namibians who need an economic opportunity, willing and able, mm. active, but there is no opportunity for them to meet. When you further interrogate those figures, you will start to see that there's a very peculiar categorizations, 15-year-olds to 19-year-olds who are not in education or training in one form or another. In a country that has got universal access to education, you want to ask yourself, who is this 15-year-old and why are they not in training education facilities that are provided for by the government? And why is this young people now accounted for as an unemployed youth? You start to understand that, okay, these may be young people who are in conflict with the law. These may be adolescent mothers who have had to drop out. These may be nomadic communities. But what we also realize is that a lot of young people who, of these 246,000 who don't have these opportunities are young people who fell out of the education system. We had a challenge with the 
secondary education system where there was the exodus at grade 10 mm. and the, it rendered a lot of out of school youth who I don't like the term were unskilled and rendered unemployable mm. because they did not get that school going certification. The problem that we have of youth unemployment is not only a graduate unemployment problem. Predominantly, it is a young person mm. living in rural Namibia who is uncertified and rendered unskilled. So in responding to closing the gap and moving this needle, we have to do targeted interventions that are reaching young, out of school, and sometimes unskilled Namibians, mm. predominantly in peri-urban and, and, and rural areas. I also just want to acknowledge that, yes, there is definitely a challenge with labor, moving from education to labor, the transition. Yeah. And there are many graduates. Um, the last graduate study that was produced by the, by the, by the Higher Education Commission indicated a number of about 67,000 graduates. What we know is that UNAM, NAST, IUM, IOL, the former education institutions, they're generating about 9,000 graduates a year. Mm -hmm. And TVET, uh, through the vocational education, another 10,000. So we can safely say that every year we are producing a cohort of 20,000 trained, skilled, qualified young people who need to move into the, into the economy, into the labor market, and they may not be spaced to absorb that cohort. Mm. So the challenge becomes very different when you begin to inter interrogate at the granular who is an unemployed young Namibian today. I hear you. So the state's version, as ably articulated by uh, Desri here, is on the question of how did we get here, <coughs> is it's always those successive events. Now we had drought, we had COVID-19, we had the global economic recession. Um, is that the version that people like yourself also have, that this is why we are here, or do you think that uh, there are other factors? Uh, you have mentioned slightly about the mismatch of uh, between policy and, and, and implement, implementation, but is that the version that you also subscribe to? Um, when we have the when we had the global economic uh, crisis, I think it's in 2009, um, a great nation suffered because of the housing market. And I've always asked myself at the time, it was Minister of Finance, or Sarako Wangero Madila, what is it that she has done different to navigate this ship to, where, to, to get us out of that turmoil? And I think, if not slightly before that, or after that, we recorded a surplus in our budget. Um, I think around 2012, 2013, uh, there was a huge debate in parliament around youth unemployment. They were saying, yeah, the figures are around 50 plus. And uh, quickly, President Buamba said, no, 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 no. Please go look for money, whatever it is. Let's implement TPEG. Now, about 10 billion was flushed into the economy to deliver temporary jobs mm. and some permanent jobs, mostly looking at um, servicing of land and also building of houses, of which when the um, massive urban land servicing program came, it took up uh, some of those TPEG projects, uh, land that was already serviced, trying to uh, get some of those things going. But of course, we didn't agree because TPEC just created a lot of tenderpreneurs and not tangible functioning uh, enterprises that we could be proud of. Mm -hmm. We saw how Namibians for the first time uh, were in bed with the Chinese and they could sell their projects for about 24 million, 50 million, whatever it is the amount that they got. And they pocketed that money and they left. And nothing was done, but government uh, tried to do something about it. Mm -hmm. uh, we, of course, we can't be oblivious uh, to, because Namibia is not a village on its own. So we are playing in this global enterprise uh, or global economy where, of course, some by design, we would be affected mm -hmm. uh, by some of those challenges. But si what we are simply saying is that we hear and we understand where those challenges are. But how long have we been speaking about our primary sector? That is an extractive industry. And we are seemingly not putting in policies 
Uh, yesterday I read that we've now, uh, part of some of fruits and veg, we've put some sort of moratorium to say, until local producers have sold enough, uh, we're not importing some in. We are trying to at least force ShopRite, the pick and pays, to buy from local producers. Because remember, look what happened when we formed AMTA, which was a good idea. When we formed AMTA, it was supposed to take from local producers and give to these big fish or these uh, big retail shops. Mm. But what those retail shops have done, they've seemingly just cancelled uh, all purchase agreements that they had with black farmers because AMTA is seemingly created to aid black farmers. Mm. So you see that we are operating in an economy where we still don't control 95% as a black community. It's still owned in the hands of the 5%. But what is it that we are doing as government? Because we are the ones who are supposed to put policies in place to say, how do we safeguard instead of us investing extra $100 in my mother? We can invest this $100 into Dimbulukeni because Dimbulukeni will be able to take care of his mother. Mm. How do we make sure that in my family, because I have... a my three sisters who have their kids and they are single mothers and some are orphaned. How do I, as a person who's economically active, contribute to the economy and ensure that the, at the same time I'm meeting government halfway? Mm -hmm. So the conversation really that we want to have is, is not necessarily to say that we, we want to be people who are bashing government. That's not our business. Our business is to say government has passed a policy to say that GIPF from today 10% or 15% of what you allocate to asset managers must be in the productive sectors of our country. And these are the conditions that we are putting there. So that those young people who are on the street, who are graduates, are able to take those that are unemployable um, because in the nature of what they find themselves. Because remember our education sector, we are now classified as one of the countries that invest heavily on education. But what are the results that we are getting? For the past... Uh, I think 30 years before the first uh, or 20 something years before the first uh, first education national policy conference that we've held under the leadership of Dr. Abraham Yambo may he so rest in peace. A man who we saw whatever he touched turned into gold but unfortunately never had enough time uh, to reform our education sector. We saw that we were flushing out a lot of young people either from grade 7 or grade 10. Where are those young people? Go to SAIS, go to Dordabes, go to Ochomuise police station. You will find those young people there. When I was in prison, I found a boy who came back for the third time who was born in 2001. His highest qualification is grade four. What else does the street uh, tell him? The street absorb you, teaches you crime, teaches you how to grab a cell phone and how you can make quick money. We have uh, degenerated the education sector where we are not making education fashionable any longer. People who are qualified with master's degree don't have jobs. A guy with grade seven is the guy who's driving a Vrupa. <laughs> is the guy who's listened to in the family. When there's a funeral, is the guy who's contributing more. So who do you expect the young people to listen to? So if we can't make those platforms available for these young people and wanting to isolate matters into drought and what, what, yes, we, are, we understand that. Somebody the other day was asking and saying, why are we sending money? to, is it Mauritius, Malawi. Uh, <laughs> Malawi, as opposed to uh, feeding these young people that are here. But we understand those diplomatic ties that Namibia also carries a responsibility mm -hmm. to do that. Why is it that, for example, now, uh, we don't have that fish smell in uh, Wolfish Bay? Did our fish disappear? No, they are still in the ocean. But how did we get to the level where we are? It's because of people who are not held accountable for doing what they must be able to do. Yeah. We, he, we have Namdia, for example, just to perhaps just go out of topic a bit. Yeah, quick one. Yes, one. we criticized yeah. Namdia uh, when it was established. Today, Namdia is, is saying, look, this is the dividends that we are giving to government in millions. But we criticized the birth of Namdia. But the guys were saying, the BS takes our diamond, puts a price on it, decide what to, to buy, to what price they are going to sell to themselves, and still tell you, okay, this is what we have sold these diamonds for. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't allow us to say, how do we have control of our own diamonds? Okay.
we go for the final break and then uh, return. Agenda. So, Desiree, really now, the, for a young person listening to this show tonight, an unemployed youth or a young person who is in the final stages of their university, they're about to graduate and enter the space that is called the job market, what can you say to them today? There's a lot that I can say to every young Namibian that is listening to this program this evening. I should begin by highlighting that this is nation building and it's a project a project that all of us are participating in government has a role to play in creating a platform in creating the space in enabling through a conducive environment for those who have abilities to be able to participate and to thrive while also taking care of the most vulnerable members of our society yeah. I should highlight categorically that we are not satisfied with mediocrity. We are not satisfied with the status quo. We understand the global phenomena. We believe that Namibia is capable of being an exception, that we are able to design our own solutions that respond to our own realities. Mm. And we are being innovative in that role. And I hope to touch a little bit on some of the responses by the government to respond to the, situ to the challenges of the day. But I also just want to touch on Dimbulukeni's point to say, this is the burden. The 71% youth bulge is a heavy burden, but I also believe that this is our superpower. This is the dividend that we talk about when we talk about young people reaping an economic benefit, but we can only unlock it mm -hmm. if we have the full participation of the private sector, because in a political economy, there are many players, not just the government who's setting the policy, but the private sector that is supposed to be the engine of economic growth. What is an economy? It is a collection of businesses. Mm -hmm. We have 28 sectors ac across our economy. There is a collection of businesses across those sectors. How do we ensure that our businesses are sustainable, that they are growing, and that they are able to provide decent gainful employment for our bulging youth population? Mm -hmm. How do we ensure that the environment is less hostile for a startup? And I, I do agree that at the moment, there is need for us to avail more risk capital on the market. Our funding model at the moment is um, highly driven by commercial finance and commercial finance is credit finance. So it is, it, it is at risk and it is risk averse. Mm -hmm. But without ignoring the role of the state, 30% of the Development Funding Institute, the DBN, 30% of their loan book is going to, you, to SMEs and women. And within that 30%, specific portfolios for youth-owned SMEs with preferential rates, with an age limit of 35, government has even introduced a credit guarantee scheme, recognizing that young people don't have an asset base, many are starting from ground zero, and they are unable to secure the, the credit loans that they are looking for. Mm -hmm. So government has issued a credit guarantee scheme. I think a lot has been said about education and its contribution. I want to not leave this interview without also informing the viewer that the reforms that we saw in 2016 
are very, very crucial for us to correct the challenges that we are seeing with, with the large number of out of school youth. Yeah. By the education sector now introducing the dual stream of academic and, and uh, um, TVET track for skills, we've actually mitigated that exit point. We've mitigated the number of young people we're losing to go without a certification and we're increasing the, the number of young people who are skilled. The curriculum is a world-class curriculum. Namibia is lauded for being one of the few countries who have developed and designed their own curriculum. These are the teething problems. This is the introductory process. This is the initial inception stages of change management and ensuring that it works and it is fit for purpose. But we should be the ones to believe in our own innovation and reinvention. In terms of um, what government is doing, also, and this can sometimes be misunderstood, sometimes deliberately, that government has a role to play in creating opportunities, employment opportunities. Mm. But even though government is a massive employment creator with a workforce of 107,000 strong, it is, not the it is not the sole responsibility of the state to create jobs. It is the responsibility of the state to create the environment where businesses can grow and create jobs. I was listening to an in interesting presentation by the NIPDB, the Investment Promotion and Development Board. That board was established in 2020 and brought into the presidency because of the priority that is attached to investment promotion and MSME development. And they are able to articulate and quantify the investment pipeline. They have secured to date 2.9 billion worth of investment and they've got a pipeline that is going into almost hundreds of billions. Mm. Whether we realize that potential depends on the responsiveness of our institutions. And I should remind you that leaders deliver through institutions. The president delivers through institutions. For us to secure that investment pipeline requires Co coordination, coherence, collaboration across the different sectors between mm. Home Affairs and Ministry of Forestry to get the permits to secure that investment. Once that investment is in the country, like the 2.9 that we 2.9 billion that we have already secured over yeah. the past 24 months, it creates jobs and new opportunities for young people. We are also intentional in government to leverage the procurement muscle of government. With government taking up 65% of the economy, we know that procurement is important, it is catalytic, it can create access for SMEs to serve the government at a contract basis. That is why we've introduced the Code of Good Practice and we've revised the Public Procurement Act with very, very explicit, strong preference clauses for youth-owned enterprise SMEs, indigenous Namibian-owned businesses, businesses owned by women, previously disadvantaged people, because we want to target and to strengthen those firms. We have been piloting um, exemptions for an association that brand themselves as the Association of Unemployed Artisans. Mm. These are our young people who we have trained in the TVETs. They are now skilled and qualified and able to go into the market. And government has responded to say, you've met us halfway. You've organized yourselves. You have the skills, you are representative, you're at the regional level, at the constituency level. We will work with you to give you some of our maintenance programs, mm. some of our um, contracts for the rehabilitation of government infrastructure. Through those interventions, we've been, create, we've been able to not only create, but to cascade uh, the benefit to young people because it is very difficult for a young artisan, a young carpenter, uh, plumber to compete at a contract level mm. with an established a uh, company that has already got rapport, has got the balance sheet, has got the track record. Um, we are strengthening our e-governance portal, the EGP, so that we are able to publish these opportunities in a manner that is equitable, in a manner that is transparent, so any young Namibian will be able to see. Mm. But that requires our own government institutions who are making these opportunities available to use the portal of EGP. So we also need your assistance to compel and to hold institutions accountable and say, why are you not using the EGP? Because we as young people, we want to see those opportunities. Finally, I should just share with you that one of the flagship programs under the 
uh, Harambe Prosperity Plan is work integrated learning. Mm. There's a lot of young people who are either completing their tertiary or young people who have graduated and have not had that opportunity to get the experience to put onto the CV to secure their first job. And although we do have an internship and apprent apprenticeship program within the government, and we have piloted a little bit within the TVET sector in HPP1 between 2016 and 2020, we are now in the process of rolling out, designing and finalizing the modalities for a national internship apprenticeship program. We don't have a law in the country that makes it mandatory for cooperative education. We don't believe you need a law and a business needs to be legislated to do the right thing. I think businesses need to also meet government halfway as we respond to the socio-economic challenges. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen MTC spearheading, I've seen the first RAN group rolling out graduate training programs. This must be a voluntary response for every corporate conscious citizen that we need to, 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 to create these opportunities for young people and no law should be passed to make it compulsory. Yeah. So at the moment it's voluntary and there are other initiatives that government is obviously facilitating and driving, not excluding our own um, efforts to create more employment opportunities through the security cluster as reported by the president. Yeah. But over and above, this is a collective burden and the responsibility must be met uh, comprehensively. Thank you for that. The last throw of the dice is with <laughs> you, Mr. Naoyama. So you, you go through a lot of trouble for what I think is a cause that you believe in, and that is really to fight for social justice, uh, especially where young people are concerned. Um, and you do it at a very, very high cost. Because you go to jail, your reputation is, is, is in trouble. You have, you, you are taken away from your family that you are supposed to be providing for, for a long time. And, and for some times, you, last year you were in jail for, for three months. That's a long time. What is it that makes you go through all that briefly? Uh, and hearing what uh, Desiree has just said, does that now mitigate the number of times we are going to see you run in trouble with the law? Uh, I think uh, after this last arrest, uh, what has come clear is that uh, the government has, has created war and, and they've made me a marked person. And you can tell this from the testimony of the investigator. Even when the learned mag magistrate says that you don't have evidence to one, have arrested this guy, you can't place this guy at the scene, you, can't, you don't have anything in your possession to say this is the guy who said this must happen. So even after complying with the law, you thought for the first time the guys are going to agree with you. At least we don't need to agree all the time, but let's just agree. But you realize that, okay, there's uh, some sort of personal agenda. We are now investigating whether it's coming from the higher authorities in government or it's within the police cluster. But you've realized that our police is now becoming a politicized police. Uh, but of course, that's a discussion for another day. But what uh, I want to say is that, you know, when you've been around for a very long time, we started this thing at student activism. We were spearheading those debates with Minister Richard Namwandi. Uh, I think we all, but we've started with uh, Abraham Yambo to speak around this in, uh, apprenticeship program of government. So it comes a very long way. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were saying, why is it difficult for you to go to a government office just to get uh, a document? It's because the filing system is not in place. And uh, when you hear some of these things coming, you, you feel good because you were the forefront of uh, hitting the ground running then but also it, it should be legislated in a point where it becomes mandatory for people to know that not just curbing unemployment but aiding us to get this service that we want to to get people sign performance agreements uh, in as government employees but who checks them you know a uh, guy comes with his house frustrations, this is what happens. The issue around unemployed artisans, for example, is a, it's a project that I myself uh, looked closely at. And there were challenges and we have highlighted them with the Ministry of Finance, um, Ministry of Works, and how the people who are running this association uh, are fully gainfully employed elsewhere. So they go and get these young people, group them together, get this government. It's a typical tender system and still underpay 
these people, even when the rates that they are given to government, because the government gives them, what the good thing at least government does is to say, this is what you must pay these people. Mm -hmm. But these guys who are running this thing go and cut what government uh, says. So it's a good policy from government, the implementation aspect and the monitoring and evaluation. Because remember, government buys and procures the material, all they do is the labor and they, they get paid for that. Which is one of the greatest things that is government trying to aid these young people to gain some sort of experience, they also need some sort of mentorship. And this is what we are saying, that if government can say, FNB or Bank of Namibia can say, FNB, Standard Bank, Bank Vendor, uh, Bank BIC, uh, and all asset managers, this is in your credit department. This is the amount of loans that we want you to allocate to these women when we speak about previously disadvantaged and you go to um, employment equity, in their definition, it includes white women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we as black people are previously disadvantaged, both men and women, but apparently because women, white women are also, they, they fall under that cluster. So when we speak about this previously disadvantaged, you must never forget that those that are benefiting from 95% of our economy are also included in there. So what we are saying is simply to say that, look, we have proper designed elements where banks must be able to take in startups and allow we understand we are operating in a capitalist system where we must go through these credit schemes or credit um, applications and all that we, we we don't we are not saying we want free handouts all we are saying is let's create a platform so parliamentarians ought to have already started to say how do we deal with the startups act mm -hmm. that regulates fdis into startups or whatever investment, even if you are a Namibian who is uh, Kambwa trading, Kambwa is still under SME mm -hmm. until to date. But where is our evaluation to say, how, how do we regulate this graduation from an S to an M to a multi-millionaire company that we are proudly going to be proud of as Namibians? Mm -hmm. So yes, we would continue to vigorously campaign uh, to one champion where government is doing well. We are not enemies of the state, even if they want to make us enemies. We are here to assist government in meeting our people's needs halfway. Some of us may not have political aspirations to be there because remember that once you start a course, yeah. you, you are always uh, no, they want to get to parliament, they want to do what, they want to do what, that is what they are interested in. So they are politicizing this issue. So that is why one of the fundamental aspects Time is up. Time yes, is up. yes. Well, that we put to, to this unemployment protest was to say, let's open it up to everybody. Every Namibian who's uh, in the office, office of the president, and we thank Desiree, for example, for being the first government official to say, look, let's elevate this issue. Let's have this conversation here. So in conclusion, Toivo, is that we will always be on the side of the poor, will always be on the side of the downtrodden, will always be on the side of those that live in the shanty town so that they can at least have inspiration to do better for their lives going forward. Wonderful. Thank you, sir, for coming. Thank you, Desiree, for coming. It was a very wonderful conversation to have and uh, time flew. So we must uh, perhaps navigate this uh, possibility again in the near future. If you'll give me 30 seconds, just to clarify yeah. that. She's going to beat me now, my direct, <laughs> my, my producer, but yes, please, 30 seconds. This is a government that cares about its people. This is not a government that is fighting its citizens. This government derives its power and authority from the electorate. Young people instituted this government and the president. And Dimbulukweni, there is no contradiction. This is a pro-poor government that is working to alleviate the plight of the downtrodden. This is a government that cares and is taking care. So there is no opposite pole. I think we are on the same team. We are citizens. We are patriots. I put it to you that even those of us who are serving the government, we are activists transforming systems from within in order for the youth agenda to be put at the heart of development. So I think that if we can advance a common agenda generationally, we'll be able to yield the kind of impact that we want. Let us stop looking at ourselves from opposite ends and realize that the issues that are affecting young people affect all of us equally. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. That was uh, tonight's show with uh, Desiree Obal and uh, Dimbulukani Naoyama. Thank you for watching. Thank <laughs> you.